This song that we're about to learn is a song that's entitled, Somebody's Hurting My Brother. Now this song was actually born in a town hall meeting around coal ash. And the meeting came about because Duke Energy was spilling coal ash into poor black and brown and poor white neighborhoods. After hearing testimony after testimony of people who were impacted physically and mentally by the coal ash, this song came as an inspiration of those testimonies. So I'll call to you, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on, and your response is, far too long. Yes, it's gone on. Far too long. It's gone on. Far too long. Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on. Far too long. Now the end is, and we won't be silent anymore. We'll say that together. And, and we won't be silent anymore. Okay? And so we'll try the rehearsal version, which goes. Oh, oh, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. Oh, oh somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. to everyone who has gathered here uh, to this wonderful event. My name is Charlene Howard and I am the current chair of the National Council of Pax Christi USA. And in, uh, in partnership with the Poor People's Campaign and many others, which I'll name momentarily, we are just so glad, happy and encouraged for you to be with us this evening. Uh, first, I would just like to say uh, a few um, things for you to prepare for this evening's uh, presentation, uh, particularly regarding Zoom. First, uh, we are recording this uh, session 
And we will send out the video to anyone who has registered and who is here this evening. Also, we ask that you remain on mute, but feel free to use the chat and reaction buttons questions for questions and comments. So uh, again, please use the chat function uh, for those purposes. Uh, one other thing that will be helpful for you is to get the best view of our speakers uh, and other people who are featured this evening. We ask that you look to put your uh, screen on speaker view. And you can do that if you look in the upper right corner of your screen, you'll see a rectangle with three little dots. And if you hover over it, it uh, gives you some options for view and select the one that says speaker view. And that will assist you in being able to make that happen. Uh, this coming together in partnership uh, this evening is so very important uh, because first of all, we know that the Poor People's Campaign has been going strong for so many years at this point and are continuing uh, to raise the voices of poor and marginalized people in this country and being a unifying force. And on June 18th, there is yet another one of the gatherings uh, that they are asking for support from all of us to uh, be allies with those who uh, are living below the poverty line, those who are uh, disenfranchised, to be able to have their voices heard and make change in this country uh, against those things that are important in their platform, which I'm sure uh, Reverend Liz and others will share with you later on. So people are hurting and they've been hurting for far too long and we're tired of it and they are tired of it. So we hope that through this evening, you will be energized and you will put into action that energy uh, in joining in the action that is taking place on June 18th as well as recommitting yourselves to any and all actions that help support uh, bringing about equality in our country and especially for those who are discriminated against because uh, of their economic circumstances and um, other reasons. Uh, I wanna thank our sponsors who are with us this evening and made this possible. The Sisters of Mercy of the Americas, Pox Christi USA, Franciscan Action Network, Leadership Conference of Women Religious, Catholic Committee of Appalachia, Network, Catholic Social Justice Lobby, Sisters of St. Joseph of Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the Quixote Center. At this time, I would like to introduce uh, Bishop John Stowe and Sister Pat, who will uh, address us at this time. Thank you, Charlene. Greetings, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you from a distance. I'm coming to you from the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Santa Clara University's beautiful campus in Santa Clara, California. Really happy to be part of this gathering as Catholics reflect on participation in the Poor People's Campaign. You know, I think this is one of the best ways that we can truly honor the vision and the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who dreamed of a beloved community. And in this time of polarization, this time of great separation, this time when we have lost our sense of the common good and we see too many people suffering and suffering again from the indifference of their sisters and brothers, it is so important that we dream once again of this beloved community and we learn how to make it happen. Martin Luther King knew that it was not in anyone's best interest that minority communities and the oppressed communities would be at odds with each other, but rather discover their common ground and the need to work for justice together and bring the rest of the larger community along. I think that has great resonance with our Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching is founded on the notion of the common good because we are social beings. We depend on each other. We are interrelated with each other and we were created for community. None of us can survive on our own. We're all interdependent. Systems that create false dependencies and insist on having some people who are less uh, independent than others 
are undermining the common good as envisioned by our scriptures, by our tradition, from the prophets to Jesus and to the modern day saints who struggle to bring about this great vision. Our common good is also rooted in a, a, a great value for the dignity of the human person. And we see so much that is degrading to human beings. We hear it in the rhetoric that's being used. We see it in the attacks on one another. We see it in the systemic poverty. We see it in people who are trapped in jobs that have no future. People who are trapped by jobs that don't pay sufficiently so that they can lift their family out of poverty. People who are trapped by the lack of access to healthcare. People who are trapped because they are victims of, of unfair migration laws people who are trapped because they are stuck in a criminal justice system that has nothing to do with justice and very little to do with crime, but has so much more to do with the punishment of humanity and keeping certain people out of the public. When we gather together as a poor people's campaign, we are reflecting the values of the poor man from Nazareth, the God who became poor to walk with us and to teach us about solidarity. Pope Francis has spoken tremendously about the importance of everyone in the world having access to housing, having access to jobs, having access to what is necessary for basic uh, survival to even have land. In his latest encyclical, now a couple of years old, Fratelli Tutti, the Pope envisions for us what it means to emerge from this pandemic and to emerge from this pandemic transformed in a positive way. He laments that too quickly we moved away from noticing that we are all in this together and that we missed a great opportunity to fight a virus together and to work together to strengthen the bonds among the human family. Still, we need to learn from these opportunities to grow together because there's an even greater threat coming our way with climate change and a catastrophe if we don't act quickly and in solidarity with one another. Of course, Pope Francis reminds us again and again that those who suffer most from climate change are the ones who contributed least to it. And too often, it's those who are struggling to make a living who are expected to lose work, like in my own Appalachia, um, lose the only jobs that they knew in coal mining and because of the need to preserve the environment, but no path to a better future, no path to legitimate jobs and job training that's needed at this time. There are so many areas that the Poor People's Campaign is calling attention to that sound nothing like the rhetoric that we're hearing from the major political parties. It's important that we emphasize the human dignity and the common good as the basis for what we want to see in our political order. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm somewhat fearful about the whole no notion of participatory democracy. And I think Poor People's Campaign is one excellent way to raise our voices and make sure that this vision of a democratic system in which all are created equal and all should have an equal voice in the system, uh, it's a way to bring our voices to the fore. In Fratelli Tutti, the Holy Father talks about getting beyond the difficulties that we've experienced in the pandemic, recognizing that the old virus of racial inequality and racism continues to surface itself. And the antidote is to create relationships, to create political friendships, he even uses that terminology, and to recognize the universal fraternity to which we are all called to participate in. I wish you all well as we go through this process and especially on June 18th, when the poor people gather in Washington DC to lift up a loud and clear voice about the need for a common good and the dignity of the human person. God bless you all and continue to enjoy and learn about tonight and be motivated to be part of this great movement. Thank you, Bishop Stowe. Uh, you spoke so eloquently about that need, especially for relationship. Um, that's why we are doing this uh, event this evening is to strengthen our relationship with those who are also working toward making things better for our brothers and sisters who are suffering from the effects of poverty and other inequalities. 
For your information, Bishop Stowe is the third bishop of Lexington, Kentucky, and is our beloved bishop president of Pax Christi USA, as well as the Episcopal advisor to the Catholic Committee of Appalachia. Bishop Stowe is a conventual Franciscan friar who previously served in El Paso, Texas, and as rector at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Consolation in Ohio. He has been a consistent advocate for social justice, speaking out on issues such as peace, poverty, racism, LGBTQ inclusion, and nonviolence. So again, thank you so much for your inspirational words, Bishop Stowe. Great. Now, I'd <laughs> now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Sister Patricia McDermott. Sister Patricia is president of the Institute of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas, which includes the continental U.S., Caribbean, Central, and South America, Guam, and the Philippines. Sister Pat has a background in higher education and pastoral theology and has served in leadership roles for the Sisters of Mercy for over three decades. With her leadership, the Sisters of Mercy have been a key faith partner in the Poor People's Campaign for several years now, serving on the campaign's National Prophetic Council and working with various state committees. Sister Patricia, we welcome you. Uh, thank you, Charlene, and thank you to everyone. And on behalf of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas, we're really grateful to be part of this evening's program. And we're honored certainly to serve with all of those who uh, are co-sponsoring to make this webinar possible. We're especially grateful to the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral, and I stress that word moral revival, and all the work that is already in process to bring people to Washington, DC on June 18th. As Sisters of Mercy and as a Mercy community, uh, we'll be there in our purple t-shirts. Uh, it's clear, you know, certainly we're, we're living in a very urgent moment right now, given the dangers to our democracy, the ever widening wealth gap, and all of the um, incredible demonstrations of uh, spiraling violence, all of which comes together to elevate the call for a national moral revival, as certainly Martin Luther King uh, gave us that directive when he launched the original Poor People's Campaign. Like many of you, the Sisters of Mercy um, see the moral uh, march on June 18th and the ongoing work of the Poor People's Campaign as a movement and a momentum to address the interlocking injustices that of systemic racism, poverty, militarism, and the war economy, ecological devastation, and a distorted narrative of religious nationalism. Each of these um, injustices needs our attention and needs our support now and into the future. Like the Sisters of Mercy, many gathered here tonight reflect the same commitments as that of the Poor People's Campaign. The campaign's principles resonate with our own critical concerns of the Sisters of Mercy, that of earth, women, racism, addressing immigration, and certainly trying to do all that for the lens of nonviolence. All of us, the Poor People's Campaign, each of you, Mercy, we're all gathered and we place at the center of our agenda those who are made poor and disenfranchised. The campaign also gives expression to our faith's preferential option for those made poor and a desperate need to honor the image of God in every human being by standing in solidarity with those most impacted and doing so in nonviolent, nonpartisan behaviors and action. And finally, the campaign offers many resources and opportunities for engagement. And we'll hear more about those this evening. Their recent report on the way that COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affected poor and low-income people on all levels is riveting and I encourage you to find it posted on their website. So we're grateful for the new faces who have joined this decades long effort because faith-based organizing for social justice is as crucial today as it ever has been. 
Certainly Sisters of Mercy, other religious women, all religious faith-based people, clergy, lay people. Uh, we found ourselves in Selma on the front lines of the civil rights demonstrations and marches, and in so many marches and demonstrations since then. Our goal for June 18th is to bring a minimum of 50 Mercy-related people, participants in a DC march. Uh, while we continue to animate the movement at state and local levels by connecting sisters, associates, people from our ministries uh, to those state committees and those campaigns. And for those of you who work in direct service, we encourage you to bring your clients for they are the voices that will speak. They are the voices that will be heard. They have the integrity because they are the low uh, income wagers and they certainly are at the center of this movement. So again, we thank you for spending your time here this evening, being with all of us, and certainly for continuing your good work to mobilize others, to bring together a huge crowd to Washington on June 18th. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much, Sister Pat. Uh, you, you really are calling us to come together uh, by the example of your community. And so I'm sure that many of us will consider and actually act on that consideration to be present. So again, thank you for your motivation and your encouragement for us to be a part and with you in this. At this time, I would like to introduce one other person who is very important to uh, all that we are doing this evening. And that is uh, Perlette. Uh, Perlette is uh, the, is one of the members of Pax Christi also, a past uh, national chair. Uh, she is currently serving as the chair of PCART, which is our Pax Christi anti-racism team. Uh, she is a member of the Justice Coordinating Commission with the Sisters of Providence, the National Association of Black Catholic Administrators, and the Black Catholic Theological Symposium. She currently works as the coordinator of the Black Catholic Ministry in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. Uh, she's gonna share with us the best kept secret in the Catholic Church, Catholic social teaching, and how important that is for us to live that out. So Perlette Springer, we welcome you into the program. Thank you so much for the intro and the invite to speak. Good evening, everyone. Growing up Catholic in the United States in a predominantly Black Catholic church, I was formed to think that being Catholic was a way of life. Yes, mass on Sunday was a requirement. Receiving the sacraments, especially the sacrament of reconciliation was a requirement. However, how you lived your life outside of those physical Catholic structures was the one true way of being Catholic, living your faith through prayer, study, and action. Catholic social teachings continues to be one of the best kept secrets of the Catholic Church. The seven basic themes are interwoven, carrying the same message that leads us to live a moral life that is inclusive of all of God's creation. Each theme carries the message of life and dignity of the human person, that the human life is sacred and the foundation of our society, whether it be a socialist society, a communist society, or a capitalist society. We are no society without the human person. As the themes of call to family, community, and participation, and rights and responsibility remind us there is only one race, and it is the human race. Paul explains this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As a body is one, though it has many parts, if one part suffers, the parts, all the parts suffer with it. When one part of the human race hurts in Africa or Asia or Russia or Europe or Central America or here at home. We all hurt, we all suffer. As individuals, we do have individual rights and responsibility. As a collective, as a human race, 
we have the collective right and responsibility for the parts of the body that are weaker or seen as less honorable. As a collective, we are called to the solidarity of the human race. Are we not all a creation of our God, along with other creatures that roam the earth, the sky, and the waters, the plants, the trees? The Poor People's Campaign calls for a moral revival in this country, of a, a revival where we, creatures of the Creator, work in solidarity to stand up for those who live in constant and consistent poverty and oppression. The need for options for the poor and the vulnerable and the dignity of work and rights of the workers, fair wages for fair labor. According to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, Jesus says that the poor will always be with us. But is Jesus talking about the financially poor or the spiritual poor? Is it not those who are poor in spirit that are the root cause for those being poor financially? As a country, we have come a long way in our understanding of what it means to be Christian. We tend to forget that this country was built upon Christian beliefs, even though they were distorted to say the least. But as a people, we have grown, we have learned, and we have deepened our understanding of who we are and whose we are. As Paul stated in his first letter to the Corinthians, indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary, and those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we surround with greater honor. And our less presentable parts are treated with great with greater prosperity, whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part that is without it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. So let us move forward collectively and work towards caring for those considered the weakest part of the body, caring for those considered the less honorable parts of the body. Let us move forward and collectively work to address the needs of our brothers and sisters, to collectively work to realize our true self, that we are running one race, the human race. Thanks. Thank you, Perlette. Indeed, uh, the dignity of every human person is at the core of our Catholic teaching and belief. So thank you for highlighting how that comes through our principles of Catholic social teaching. I would like to now introduce to you uh, one of the key figures in the uh, Poor People's Campaign, and that is the Reverend Dr. Liz Steele Harris, who is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival with the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. She is the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice. She is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church in the United States and teaches at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. She is the author of numerous books and articles and recipient of numerous awards for her work in faith-based organizing and social justice. Social, excuse me, social justice. She received her bachelor's of arts from the University of Pennsylvania and her master's of divinity and doctorate of divinity from Union Theological Seminary and is a driving force in the movement towards a third reconstruction addressing poverty and calling for a systemic change from the bottom up. She will also share with us a video um, near the end of her remarks. So uh, Dr. Liz, we welcome you into the gathering. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all. And I was actually hoping we might show the video first and then I'll, I'll jump right in. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung. And it's just unfathomable 
what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. At one time, poverty was a temporary condition. You were on a down slope for a minute, but you could bounce back up. We can't bounce back up today. It's permanent. We're not going back to the factory and building cars and trucks like we once did. A job working at McDonald's or the grocery store doesn't pay enough for one person to live. We work a 40-hour work week, still not enough. Living from paycheck to paycheck. Rent is $600 a month. We got water bill, electricity. I do this for my kids, and it, and it hurts. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life, and I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. We were in the height of mass water shutoffs. This entire neighborhood um, was shut off all at one time. I saw all my neighbors get shut off right in front of me. It was kind of terrifying. I'm 42 years old, and I'm a cashier at McDonald's. I had lost my house. You're welcome to come inside. There's a lot of people that are living in their cars. You never notice until you're in the same situation. I don't have stuff to give my children. I'm paying all these bills, and they need school clothes and stuff. They be asking me for I can't give it to them. Now I'm a Kansas farmer's wife. Kansas farmers are committing suicide. Why? They're usually in debt, up to their eyeballs. I see poverty in my own community. You know, there's a 70% unemployment rate in my in the reservation right now. Here in New York City, we're home to millionaires and billionaires, and we have so many people living in the street, and that's just not right. I've been a homeless veteran twice, uh, lived in a shelter. I've been living down here since I was 17. My only chance of going to college was joining the Army. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. 700,000 people in this country are on the verge of losing their food stamps. This budget calls for shrinking the social safety net programs like Medicare. I just know that everything that's happening to us isn't right. I'm in stage five of kidney disease. I fell behind on my health care, and they canceled my health insurance, and they told me uh, I have to wait until open enrollment. There's only five stages of kidney disease, and I'm in the fifth stage. Murder, it's murder. You know, if you ask me, it's murder. I lost a son to gun violence, and I lost a daughter. No parents should have, in America, should have to bury their, their child for a lack of medical expense. My God. Oh, no more. My God. My God, Kevin. I'm well. I'm well, y'all. I'm well. I'm well. I'm well. Because my babies ain't no more. How many more babies? How many more children? No more. I want you to know that when hands that once picked cotton, join hands of Latinos, join hands of progressive whites, join faith hands and labor hands and Asian hands and Native American hands and poor hands and wealthy hands with a conscience and gay hands and straight hands and trans hands and Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Hindu hands and Buddhist hands, when we all get together, we are an instrument of redemption. When we join hands, we can revive and make sure that the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection under the law is never taken away from anybody. So I got a question. Are the rejected ready to revive and declare that this land is your land? This land is my land. This land is our land. And together, from the State House to the White House, the rejected are going to demand that this nation never give up on being one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
So thank you so much. And again, it is just such an honor and such a joy to be with everybody today. Um, this is a beautiful um, assembly of people, uh, a powerful group of, of folks from all over. And um, just so much appreciation, so much love. Um, and so uh, proud to be uh, doing this work alongside uh, uh, powerful Catholic siblings um, all across the country. Um, since I began to organize uh, uh, as a part of a movement to take on racism and poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and this distorted narrative of of Christian nationalism, and I've I've been doing very grassroots anti-poverty organizing and and justice organizing for about 30 years of my life. Um, people have said to me uh, that our goals are just too ambitious, that demands for human rights, demands for human dignity are both politically inconceivable and impossibly expensive. So we'll quote the scripture. Uh, saying that since Jesus said the poor will be with you always, it can't be God's will that everyone shares in the abundance of our world. But when I read, and we in the Poor People's Campaign read the Bible, when we read the social teachings of our churches, we see a constant revelation of God's will that no one should be made hungry or sick or homeless or underpaid or indebted or bereft by the violence of social injustice. We read an ongoing indictment of those who would take and keep the wealth of our world for themselves and cause others to suffer. We hear a biblical command to fill the hungry with good things, like in Luke 1, not simply as caring for the poor as an end result, but building a movement, advocating for policies and structures that lift the load of poverty. And as Jeremiah 22 reminds us, admonishing nations to do no wrong to the immigrant, the homeless, the children, and do not shed innocent blood. Throughout the codes, the policies, the laws, Contained within the Bible, as well as in the prophets and the gospels and the letters, there is this call. We've heard about it already this evening. A call to end exploitation, to attend to the poor. There's a mandate of Sabbath rest, jubilee years. There's a prohibition of charging interest on survival loans, profiting from a pandemic, and commandments to pay living wages, to bring equity and legal proceedings, to give to everyone who asks of us and to welcome the immigrant neighbor, caring for the needs of everyone in this beloved community. And then we hear in Isaiah, stop depriving the rights of the poor. I think we hear echoes of, of all of these teachings also in, in the prophets of our day, uh, in the sermons of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, one year before he's assassinated, he, he preaches from the Riverside Church, uh, what is known as Beyond Vietnam. He connects racism and poverty and militarism. He suggests that uniting and organizing poor people across race and geography and issue area, this is the way to bring a revolution of moral values. It's a way to, to call for truth in a time of violence, and war and lies. And he says, a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we're called to play the Good Samaritan on my throat side, but that will only be an initial act. One day, we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not constantly be beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. 
indeed a nation, any nation, let alone the richest nation in human history that has 140 million people who are poor or one fire, one healthcare crisis, one job loss, one storm, away from economic ruin, such a nation is in desperate need of restructuring. It's what we are calling for of a third reconstruction, fully addressing poverty from the bottom up. And, and these times, these times when we ha we're seeing these attacks on, on voting rights and our democracy, when we're seeing people losing their health care in the worst health care crisis in generations, when we're throwing out more food than it takes to feed not just every hungry person in this country, but across the world, these are the times when prophets and prophetesses must rise up, remind us of God's demand for justice, and keep on organizing to make it so. Dr. King also, the night before he's killed, in his last speech he says, it's all right to talk about long white robes over yonder in all of its symbolism, but ultimately people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey, but God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat three square meals a day. It's all right to talk about the new Jerusalem, but one day God's preachers must talk about the new New York, the new Atlanta, the new Philadelphia, the new Los Angeles, the new Memphis, Tennessee. And this is what we have to do. This is the call of our moment. This is what we have to do. We have to put people over prophets in the here and the now. And we have to do so by organizing and mobilizing and registering and engaging and educating and empowering folks in a moral movement from the ground up. We're living in the midst of what is often called a Kairos moment, a time of great change and transformation when the old ways of society are dying and new ones are being born. There is an emergency, many, many emergencies going on, and we need what Dr. King calls brigades of ambulance drivers willing to nonviolently disrupt the existing order. We're living in many different valleys of dry bones, just like the prophet Ezekiel. And we must cry out, can these bones live? In this moment, we have sick and uninsured people saying to the leaders of faith communities and saying to our politicians, if you choose, you can heal me, much like that leper says it to Jesus back thousands of years ago. We need and already have so many of you in the Portugal campaign because we're building a moral movement led by the people. We're coming together, we're organizing together, we're uniting together, we're addressing these interlocking injustices of racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy. We're rejecting this distorted narrative that blames poor people and queer people and women and immigrants for all of our society's problems, tries to pit us against each other and feeds us the lie that this is as good as it gets. And so we are trying to choose life and truth and justice and peace and solve basic problems, restructure society around the needs of the people. And to do this in this year, in 2022, after a million people have died from COVID, most of them poor, we are organizing the largest gathering of poor and low income people, moral leaders, activists, when we come together for a mass poor people and low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington and to the polls on June 18th. We are assembling, we are marching on June 18th because any nation that ignores nearly half of its citizens is in a moral, economic and political crisis. When there are abundant resources to meet our needs, we must then march and assemble to summon the political will and the moral conscience to actually make it so. It's time for us to nonviolently disrupt and protest and shake up and alter the direction of our nation towards love and justice and truth and equality and equal protection under the law. And we must do, as we talk about in our campaign, more 
more to make this nation live up to our possibilities, more to address these injustices, more to change the narrative, more to build power amongst those most impacted, more to realize this agenda that can build and lift from the bottom so that everybody can rise. The Mass Poor People and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington on June 18th will be a generationally transformative declaration of the power of poor and low wealth people and our moral allies to say that a system that is killing all of us needs to be transformed. And we can't, we won't be silent anymore. I look forward to seeing you all in Washington and helping us to organize buses and caravans and marches and bike rides to join us in D.C., to meet us in D.C., and I think to give us some more uh, uh, of our marching orders and some of the, the creative tools and strategies that we have to be mobilizing, 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 organizing, organizing, organizing. We're going to get to hear from one of my colleagues, but it is truly a joy to be with you all, and I, I so appreciate all of the organizations that have gathered here. Um, all of the folks who have a, a, a chance to keep on pushing uh, to see real change in our society and to help bring a reign, a reign of justice and peace and love here on earth. And so thank you so much for the work you're doing. Uh, meet us in DC. Dr. Thea Harris, you, your words remind me of a song we sing in our, used to sing in our church when all God's children Get together, what a time, what a time, what a time. And indeed, that is what you are calling us to uh, with all of what you have laid out uh, in your words, that truly faith without works is dead. If we are followers of Christ, we must act uh, and pray and act some more uh, because that is what brings about change and hope and, and the kingdom of God. So thank you so much for uh uh, reviving us in what it is that we are called to do by our faith, uh, our collective faith, because we serve one God. And now that we're so excited and pumped up, first, I'm going to give a little couple of reminders as people are uh, continuing to put things in the chat. Please do that. Put your questions. Um, I see some people sharing resources and uh, links and things, and that's great. Uh, but certainly any questions or comments that you have, please uh, add those in the chat as well. And as time permits, we will address some of those or certainly follow up with you afterwards for anyone who has registered. Uh, so I would like to bring to us now to keep us going, all right, so that now that we, we are excited and motivated, what to do, what to do, what is ours to do? So Dr. Adam Barnes, um, who is the National Faith Co-Leader for the Poor People's Campaign, and Director of Religious Affairs at the Cairo Center will give us those next steps and uh, our marching orders of what we can do to make uh, June 18th a memorable, impactful, and effective action. Dr. Barnes? Amazing. Thank you, Charlene. And thank you, Bishop Stowe and uh, Angie and, and Roxana and Jean, everybody that helped to pull this amazing group together. Um, it just... Yeah, it just really warms my heart to to see um, this amazing group, and 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 just confirms that I think we are all seeing in these times that uh, the way to 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 have faith and be faithful and walk with God is to take action um, and bring about the world we know we deserve and we know that's possible. And so I'm just grateful um, to all of you um, for the work you do and and the commitments you make and and to be up here with you. Um, so yeah, my job is pretty simple. I'm going to not take a lot of time uh, and not cover everything because there's way too much to cover. I want to do some basic things. One, how to register. Two, how to get to DC. And then three, how to spread the word. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and just walk us through some very basics um, of that. Okay, so if the starting point would be just to go to the Poor People's Campaign website, okay? And when you get there, it's going to look like this. Um, which might, you know, is a little confusing, but but one of the slides is going to be here, RSVP for June 18. So you click on that, and it's going to take you to a whole different spot. Okay, so again, the number one thing to do is register. 
and you can either register as an individual or I saw there are a lot of groups here tonight that are um, can you can also register as a mobilizing partner, which I would suggest uh, folks do. Um, that's making a commitment to not only get yourself, but making you know the wider community you're connected to uh, to bring them. So if you want to be a mobilizing partner, I'll show you that in a second. Um, but once you do register as a mobilizing partner, your name will pop up on this list, your organization's name. Um, you can see some groups, I think, like Pax Christi, Franciscan Action Network, some folks are already on this list. So that's step one, register either as an individual uh, or as a, as a mobilizing partner. And that's where you would do the mobilizing partner. Number two is how to get there. Now, there's a lot of ways. People are marching there. People are flying there. People are, are driving, uh, taking buses. Some are local. We uh, have offered this uh, uh, service um, or we're working with this company that does a lot of like big actions. It's called rally.co. And so on the same, same website, you'll find um, this, this map right here. And if you click through this, it'll take you to their website, rally.co. And it's really uh, a really amazing kind of resource. You can find your town. You can find, you know, where you're, you know, and it'll show you whether there's a bus there. You can add a bus. You can be part of a bus. Um, and you can learn all about the ins and outs of this amazing program uh, next uh, week, or I think the next training is May 21st at 3 p.m. I'll put that in the chat as well. But uh, it's a really powerful resource. And again, this is not the only way to get to, C to DC, but it is one option. And I should also say that, that in doing this, I mean, you may be a part of an organization, you may be an individual, but the way that the campaign is organized is by the states. And so the states, over 40 of them, are organizing to bring people to DC as we speak. And you may be connected to a state campaign already, but if you're not, this is like maybe the best way to, to start is just as an organization, as an individual, to reach out to your state leaders and, um, and see what their plan is and see how they're getting to DC. Um, so that is that. That is number one, register, how to register. Number two, how to get to DC. And the last thing is how to spread the word and get other folks to DC. And that is this social media toolkit right here. This will take you to a amazing set, set of overwhelmingly helpful set of resources, the digital toolkit. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight one or two things like you can, so you can see you click through here and all of a sudden there's all of these things you can click into. Promo videos, uh, graphics, um, social media links, all the rest of it. But what I, what I just wanted to share right now was this uh, this art build toolkit and or these two things, the print materials and the art build toolkit. So print materials is going to take you to this page. And this is th like if you want to print flyers, banners, stickers, T-shirts, there's graphics in here and designs that you can take. You can add your logos and your message and like make T-shirts like like uh, the, the amazing purple T-shirts that that the Sisters of Mercy have. Uh, you can do your own with PPC logos, all that you need to do that is in this, this file. Uh, you can see there's different graphics, different sizes, um, designs, all sorts of things. So really amazing. Again, you can do, you can print really large, like 10 foot banners if you want to put them out front of your, your, your church or your community center or your home. Um, you can print like flyers that you hang up at, at, at other churches, all the rest of it. So just amazing. And that's just one piece of the puzzle, right? So much to share um, in that. In that, so that's that's the third piece. Spread the word, get others on the bus. Um, and then the last thing I'll say as I'm closing is that really what we should all aspire to do is to be Anna Hedgeman. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows of the amazing, the mighty Anna Hedgeman, uh, but she single-handedly mobilized almost forty over forty thousand people to the March on Washington in 1963. Um, so this was before we had a fancy digital toolkit and rally.co, before we had cell phones and all the rest of it. Uh, so I'm just going to put a link to inspire us all to be Anna Hedgeman. And you can read more about her and her leadership, uh, you know, over 50 years ago. So I think that's all I, I have. Again, I'll try and uh, round up all these resources and uh and and get them to your organizers so you all have them available and of course just in parting to say that you know me and reverend kaz and the faith team are here to support um 
you all and and any way we can be helpful. So uh, that's that's maybe the last option is just to reach out if we can be helpful. Thank you. And we'll see you in DC. Great. Thank you so much, Adam. We're so grateful. And thank you again to Reverend Liz and um, to Bishop Stowe and Sister Pat and Perla and all of our speakers. I know we have a couple of questions um, in the chat that we, Adam, maybe you can um, answer quickly or direct us to. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Angie Howard McParland. I work on the justice team for the Sisters of Mercy and, um, and one of the folks helping to um, get us to DC, particularly our purple shirts. So um, before we jump into the questions, I do just wanna say that I'm putting in the chat quickly, um, if you are a Mercy person, if you're connected to the Sisters of Mercy, whether you're a sister or an associate, staff, um, you know, employee, student, whatever, if you're connected to the Mercy world, we um, complicate things by having an extra registration form because we're collecting logistical information. We're planning to gather as a Mercy community um, and working with uh, transportation and lodging and all of that. So if you're connected to Mercy, the link is in there and you'll also get all these links when we send out the recording so you don't have to remember any of it. Um, but Adam, a couple of questions about where people, is there a way for people to be able to meet up with their faith group or their organization once they're in DC? Um, is one quick question. And then also about an actual address, um, again, so where people are gathering and where people can meet are some of the questions. Great. Yes, uh, folks have been uh, talking about this a lot. I think it's a great idea to kind of look at a map and designate an area where your group is going to gather, because uh, there will be a lot of people. And the address is is third in Pennsylvania. So this is if folks know DC, there's the big mall in the, in the capital. One of the streets that comes in diagonally is Pennsylvania and then it runs out diagonally to the to the White House. So that's a long street, probably a mile stretch between the mall and the White House. Uh, that whole street is is where we'll be, but we're gonna uh, the the kind of stage where we're where our speakers will be and where we'll be assembling is at third in Pennsylvania. So that's down close to the mall. And then I think you know folks should know that in the in the morning um, when things start around ten o'clock. Uh, or even before, there's going to be a Shabbat service at Freedom Plaza, which is like a little further up Pennsylvania Avenue. And that will, when that finishes, then folks are going to be kind of processing down to the to the main uh, uh, stage. So I think anywhere in that area where where it makes sense to meet, just take a look at a map and then and find a cross street or a, a landmark. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, uh, government buildings and things around there that you could say, let's meet out front of the Department of Justice or whatever it is. And uh, and that would be a good way to do it. And um, I also, also, in terms of logistics, while people are asking and schedule, we do also have on a plan for the 17th of June to have a, a community meal on Freedom Plaza, which is part of where we're permitted to, permitted to be on June 18th. Uh, in the evening, um, all are welcome. And then after that, there'll be a memorial service for all of those million plus have died from COVID and all the other pandemics of, of, of poverty and racism and militarism that, that um, plague our society. So um, those two events are on uh, June 17th. Um, and I did see a question about, had someone having trouble with the, um, with the bus? Yeah, so I, I it is not, um, you know, there's a lot of ins and outs, I think, in a lot of different ways to do it. So I would recommend that you if you can, I mean, it's a little time to wait, either reach out to someone in the state or you can reach out to me directly if you have more specific questions, I can be helpful. But I, I think the best way to do it is to go to one of these trainings. Um, I know the next one is not super early. I can see if there's one before that, but I know for sure there's one on, on uh, the 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, okay, am I missing any other? I think the only other question um, that we could address right now is about any guidance on how people figure out places to stay. Is there any, oh, great. Yeah. Would that be the okay. state committee? Would that be the best place to go? Yeah, I think that's a good place to start, of course, um, especially for states that are coming from further out. And then there are, you know, a lot of uh, folks that are offering uh, space. And, and then I think we even might have some discounts for, for different hotels and stuff, but that's still kind of coming together. So I think start first with, with folks you know. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of organizations in DC that maybe you that you know um, through you know through your organization. Start there, and then um, 
but if you're having trouble and you got a good big group and you really don't have the resources, definitely reach out. Like our, our goal is, is to make it, you know, welcoming for everybody. And, and so we'll figure it out. Thank you. The, so short version is if you have some of these logistical questions, you're going to get all the links, all the contact emails um, with the recording when we send it out. It's also a great place to start if you're not already connected to the Poor People's Campaign to reach out to your state committee. There's a huge map right on the homepage of the Poor People's Campaign. That's the best way to get connected locally. Also, the organizations that have partnered um, to sponsor this um, are all organizations who are working um, towards the June 18th gathering. So you can reach out to contacts there as well um, mm -hmm. and we're hoping for a large catholic gathering so that catholic link that you keep seeing in there make sure to use that if you register mercy you'll get that link as well and uh, we can't wait to see you all on june 18th so they and beyond i should say this is a movement yes. it's not yes. just one day exactly. it's a movement um, that we're really working for so thank you so much adam for your help and i'm going to turn it back over um, to charlene to close us out all right thank you so much adam and angie uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we have everything we need. Isn't God good? He gave us the people. He gave us the links. He gave us the motivation. And so now it is time for us to organize all of that to put it into reality. So I certainly hope that everyone here in some way participates, volunteers, helps, uh, encourages, spreads the word about the action on June 18th. And as my pastor likes to say, Monsignor Raymond East, don't meet me there, beat me there. So I certainly expect that to be the case come June uh, 18th. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, we just thank you all for being here, uh, for your prayer, for your energy, for your interest. And as we close out this uh, wonderful and important event, there will be a closing song, a new unsettling force. And as you listen to that, you are welcome to depart uh, or listen till the end. But thank you once more. God bless you all and see you on June 18th. Peace be with you. We are a new unsettling force. You say that? We are a new unsettling force. And we are powerful. And we are powerful. We are a new unsettling force. We are a new unsettling force. And we are here. And, and we, we are here. here. We are a new unsettling force. We are a new unsettling force. For liberation. For liberation. And we got nothing to lose. And we got nothing to lose. But our chains. But our chains. We are a new unsettling force. And we are powerful and new unsettling force. And 